job. I don't work making games for a living. But um, for the last 10 years, I've actually been working in the gambling industry. So one of the other major forms of addiction in the world always has been, probably always will be. Um, and there's a certain pattern to the way the players will respond to a game that makes them play more or makes them play less or not even play at all. And uh, a few years ago, they tried to rehash the old one-armed bandit poker machines where you have to pull the lever to make the, the reels go. And they wanted to do sort of time that retro feel and get a bit of a, you know, um, tie back in and thought, oh, this will be really popular because people feel like, oh, it's a bit of a throwback, you know, pulling the arm again. And it was a catastrophic failure. Um, but when we first got one at my work, that we had them to test, as soon as I, I was really excited because my grandfather, kind of normally had an old poker machine, one of the really, really old ones from like the 30s or 40s under the house when I was growing up. And I used to love playing with it, not because I knew what it actually did, I just loved the feel of pulling that lever because it was actually a clockwork mechanism that wound up a flywheel which would then link into the reels that would start them spinning. So when you pulled it, you felt yourself wind up the machine and then when you actually pulled it all the way to the end, the mechanism released and you felt you could feel through the vibrations of the arm the, the mechanism going through and going click, 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 and then the machine would do its thing. So I was very, very excited when we actually got these new one arm bandits in to test. And I walked into the room, went up to it, it had digital faces and things, which you know it was, it was a modern retelling of it. I grabbed the handle and pulled. And I immediately could tell that all they'd done was put a spring in the bottom of the arm with a button so that when you pulled back it eventually pressed against the button and that was that was all they'd done and as soon as i pulled it i let go and i turned to the head of testing who never never has gotten along with me um, so that didn't help but i said this is this is going to fail nobody's going to like this. this is terrible it completely bypasses the whole thing that made one arm bandits feel good and they said oh no you don't know what you're talking about you, you know you're too young to understand this and they went out and they passed the testing went out into venues and there's only a, a handful of them left in casinos now. They just weren't popular. Everyone said that the, you know, the, the customer feedback from venues was that players just weren't playing them. And you knew it was going to happen because that feeling wasn't there. And that, that feeling is this catharsis, this thing where the machine is actually communicating something back. And it feels good to pull the lever because you're actually feeling like you're influencing the device. Even though it's a poker machine, it's not exactly UNICEF. It's not designed to, to help you but you feel like you're able to influence it because of that amount of interaction that you're putting in and the amount of feedback you're getting back. So that got me thinking about it. And I realized that there isn't a word for that feeling. So I actually invented one which annoyed the hell out of everybody because they keep bringing it up. Um, Adela vegetation, I called it. And it's the feeling that you get when you get unwarranted pleasure out of an inane act. So who has bought a new smartphone and peeled that protective layer off? Boy, it feels good, doesn't it? It shouldn't feel good. There's no reason for it to feel good, but it does. It feels really good. You want to take time with it, you know, maybe light some candles, put on some barrier light. And sometimes when you're lucky, you'll buy like a new monitor and there'll actually be several of those panels on it and you just, you know, close the curtains and make a day of it. So that feeling happens on all sorts of things. Have you ever been packing something into a box and the thing you're packing in fits perfectly, so perfectly that there's actually an air cushion under it. And it just, you know, it slides in perfectly. Some people say that's just autism. It's not. It's it's actually, thank you very much. Oh, that's working. So it, it, it's this feeling of catharsis where this inanimate object that you're interacting with is giving you something back, even though it's inanimate. And a video game can do exactly the same thing. So. When you look at a smartphone, for example, you pull out your phone and you're playing Flappy Bird. All you're doing is actually pressing your finger against a glass panel. There's no feedback there, no, nothing haptic to actually touch your finger back. Everybody is touching the exact same glass panel, and that's all it is, it's just a flat, shiny, smooth surface. But depending on what's happening in the game, you can f get a different feeling back. And that's not just coincidence, that's not just magic, that's not just the developers have just happened upon something that's, you know, kind of cool. There is a science to it, a direct science. And when you get that happening, it makes people want to keep touching it. And the more they want to keep touching it, the more they want to keep playing your game. Same thing can happen to a key on a keyboard, the same thing can happen to the click of a mouse. It comes down to the communication that comes back from the machine to the player. 
and using that communication to inspire them to communicate back in a certain way. And that way is usually a good way, even if it is raging. Raging in a game is actually probably one of the best things you can actually induce because it makes people want to go back. So, there are some, like I was saying, there's misconceptions. You'll see a game that's popular, you know, Fluffy Bird will be making $50,000 a day, the headlines were saying, and ridiculous amounts of money. The developer had to take it off the App Store because it was ruining his life, too much money. Oh, what a problem. But, there, you know, people think, people analyze it and say, oh, it's because it was colorful, it appealed to the new generation that was coming through. No, it's not. They say, oh, it's, it's got catchy music. No, oh, it's, it's got humor to it. No, it's, it's a combination of several things. It's, it's not just any one magic thing. It's not a coincidence. You've got to mix together sight, so the visuals, your graphics, and the movement, uh, the, the forms of the motion that happen, the sound, and how it reacts to the player when, when you're actually, it actually reacts to your actions, and also the, that haptic feel that I was telling you about, that catharsis of the game. They all work together in a very specific way, which is what this lecture is going to be telling you about. So, what we're going to, I'm going to break it down, the, the, the most appealing one is going to be the sense of motion in the game, um, and I'm, that's what I'm going to spend the most time on. I'm not an expert in sound design and music design, there are plenty of people much, much more talented than me in the Brisbane scene for that, so I'm going to be sort of, uh, if, you, if you're here for that, unfortunately, I'm going to be sort of skipping over it because I don't, I don't talk about things that I feel like I know about. Um, and so, but, but motion, graphic design, all that sort of thing, as I said, I started out as an artist, as a designer, before moving into programming and, and getting into uh, game development that way. So uh, that's, that's where you're going to hear the most from me in, in this particular talk. So if you talk to a developer and you say, you know, what, what is a game, the, the, the first response, at least in their head, because they don't want to admit to saying this, is that it's a main game loop. That everything just loops, 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 and you've got to get all the processes right in that before it sinks and goes back and loops again. But unfortunately, there's so much more to it than that, and sometimes as a designer, you do have to yell at them a bit to understand this. Um, and some developers have this natural talent for it and just do it like magic, which is fantastic when you actually get to work with people like that. But what you're trying to do is choreograph an experience, not just create a repetitive loop that has a certain set of challenges, a certain set of input, and then you know, out for a high score or a best time or something like that. You're actually drawing the person in because otherwise they won't, uh, quote, end quote, listen for that feel that they get back uh, from, from the device. So the, the main part, the big part of the talk is their response. So as I was saying, there, there are multiple factors, and there's the visuals and sound and feel, but rewards and upgrades has a big part. Uh, anybody who's played a, a mobile game knows that there's the in-app purchases, all that sort of thing. There's a formula to that too. There's a reason for that there. I've, I've actually worked with too many developers that just put in in-app purchases because, and their entire justification is that's how you make money. You just put out the game free and make all the content be in-app purchases. But that doesn't inspire people to actually purchase your in-app purchases. It doesn't inspire them. Even brand new. If, if the game isn't fun and addictive to make them want to go in there and buy the extra things, then there's no point actually doing the work to put in there. So, you want to have a visual indication of the interaction around your input medium, whether it's a mouse, finger, etc. Um, you want to feel like the characters in the game, the entities in the game, know that you're there if that makes sense. So if you've got a character standing there and you have to touch something, when you touch the screen, show either the space-time continuum bending around your finger or little sparkles or something and make the character look up, you know, things like that. It doesn't have to be as direct as that, that's a very overt example, but the more you do that, the more that the game responds to your presence as a player, the more of this catharsis, this connection that will actually form. So. You want to maximize the visual impact of interaction with the game world, whether openly or subtly. People like to think, uh, people like to feel in control, and that can be amplified when the player feels as though they're directly affecting the world. So you have all these people every day that are on a bus, they've got home from work, whatever, that they've pulled out their phone, they're playing the game. They've spent all day being told what to do at their day job or, or university or wherever they are, and they like to feel in control. It's one of the things that games are good for. You can 
Uh, there have been numerous studies done on this, that just psychological studies that show that you take a game like World of Warcraft, why was it so popular? Because it makes you feel like you can be a hero, you can be powerful, you can be influential. Um, and that can happen on a very subtle level as well. You are in control of the fate of Flappy Bird. And you know, it's, it's up to you to make sure that he gets through to the end of the, the, um, the infinite run that he has to go through. Um, so it's important to actually make sure that that sense of empowerment happens, even if it's at a small level. I mean, who here has watched The Matrix? Yeah, you, Matrix, great film, but they had that whole um, whole conversation with the Oracle where she said that uh, she said that we could control people so long as we thought that, that we gave them the illusion of choice, that they felt like they had a choice. Even though you are going to be controlling the entire environment of a game, you need to make them feel like it's them that's doing it. It's sort of like a blinkers on a horse. If you will. The horse knows it's walking, it's controlling, it's walking, but it doesn't know where it's going until you point its head in the right direction. So uh, that's just that's exactly the same with a video game. You want to make um, as good a use of color and shape and movement, which I'm going to go into, uh, because there's a very distinct psychology behind them that a lot of people don't get taught nowadays, um, unless you've had a sort of more traditional background. Um, so I'll go into that and hopefully it uh, inspires you a bit. Sound is an entirely different um, matter, and, and as I said, I, I don't profess to be an expert in it whatsoever, but if you have addictive sounds, uh, what makes them addictive, we'll go into later, but if you have addictive sounds, it makes people not just want to hear them again, which makes them play the game, but they start hearing them in other things. I can remember the sound of did anyone play Secret Agent back on DOS years ago? And it's an amazing game, the sounds in it were incredible, all done with a little piezo speaker on the motherboard, um, if you weren't um, wealthy enough to have a sound blaster. And um, I still remember the sounds of him jumping. Uh, it'll pop into dreams and things, it's just because it was such an influential part of my childhood, there's no reason that can't happen anymore. I know games are a lot more saturated in the market, but there are very few games that actually stand out and make an impressive thing. How many times have you seen somebody chopping fruit particularly violently and full of fruit into it? It just sort of happens. You just want to see them throw it up into the air. Um, the, the, the cultural inf impact of them can happen very, very directly through sound and through music. So that takes place by using clever builds, subtlety in certain parts, or even silence. Um, I've actually got an example, if I can work out how to do this properly. Yes, there we go. Is it this one here? So we all played Candy Crush, I assume. Or mm -hmm. seen it. Horrifying as it is. How do I make your laptop switch over, Adam? Right? Is he here? Is he left? Right.
No. Wow, that's going to be awkward. Right, you'll have to imagine it. You've all played Candy Crush. Um, what, uh, what the example I was going to show is uh, in Candy Crush and Bejeweled and other games like that, they make use of build in the sound, which is, is quite uh, interesting how it does it. If you get a thing called a cascade where you make a match and then it resets and then makes another match and then resets and makes another match and it builds and builds and builds, you'll notice that the sound actually starts increasing in pitch higher and higher and higher. Um, you will hear the same sound playing that of all the things being taken away, but it'll get higher pitch, higher pitch, higher pitch until it hits a crescendo. Um, doing that makes the excitement because of the, the, the quality of the sound. It's an addictive sound here because it, uh, it's sort of like giving a dog a treat. When a positive thing happens, you get a treat, and then eventually the treat gets associated with a positive thing. The same thing happens with the sound. So when the blocks getting shattered sound plays, people think, oh, you know, unconsciously think that's good, I've, I've broken the blocks. But when it starts getting higher and higher in pitch, they start getting um, the, that intense feeling of good starts getting better and better and better. So they start craving these cascades and start getting particularly excited when the cascades happen. So um, both Candy Crush and Bejeweled do that, but you can also see um, sounds such as in, um, uh, what was I going to say? Mental break. Oh, yes. Uh, Jetpack Joyride is a good example, which you'll actually hear me referring to a lot in this talk because it's done perfectly. Um, during a power up that makes you move faster, the actual music starts playing faster. So it, it, it gets more intense and things like that. So it it's, uh, draws the player in and starts making them um, do a, a phenomenon called leaning on the control. I, I call leaning on the controls. Um, anybody that's ever play a console growing up as a kid uh, would know this, this phenomenon. You know that your character can only move so fast, but it still doesn't stop you trying to press the button harder than really getting into it. Um, you want that to happen, but the only reason that happens is because of that, that build, and things like inspiring the build with sound is, is uh, a key way of actually factoring that in. So, when it comes to influence, this is when I say influence, I mean your influence on the game, your communication into the game to get something back. Um, you have to remember that games are a form of escapism, and because of that you need to give them a goal, you need to give them a task, but at the same time you don't want to overwhelm them. A good example of this is the, uh, Ski Safari, fantastic game, and one of the number one causes of lack of productivity in my own work, because I just pure addiction on that game. It's incredible. But it's clever in the way it does it. It gives you only three tasks at a time. A lot of mobile games have followed this form. It's a very good form because you don't get overwhelmed. If you're trying to work on one task and trying to complete it and it's just eluding you and eluding you, you can go to one of the other ones. And if you finish that one, it gets replaced with another one. So you've always got an out, which gives you that sense of choice. But you're still just going through the task list. And eventually, you might accidentally finish the one that you didn't quite get. Because naturally, when you first start playing a game, you're not going to be good at it. It only takes playing it to actually get good at it. And if you've got a task that requires you to be so good, and you can't complete it, it just means you're not good enough yet. So if you go on to another task, you get better at the game by playing the game or complete that other task. So 
you really need to factor in how that task is going to be portrayed to the user because that is going to be their direct influence in the game. You've got to give them a why for playing the game and make it clear and how it's presented is important. So the difficulty of a game is going to be a, a big factor. Uh, Flappy Bird's a good example of that. I first heard of Flappy Bird because somebody was bragging about it at my office. They'd gotten to 32 points. And I thought, that's really weird. Why are they getting excited about getting to 32 points? And then they showed me the game and I tried it and I got two points. <laughs> and that uh, made me realize what it's like. So that, that game is known to be difficult. Um, but because it's so colorful and simple and there's one controls of the entire game, it doesn't seem like it should be difficult. It seems like it should be easy as hell, but at the same time, it's really, really difficult. So you want your game to be difficult, obviously, but you don't want it to be so difficult that people just rage out and leave. And you don't want it to be so easy that people get bored and stop playing. But the difficulty that it is, you have to try and mask. You have to make the game seem like, I should be able to do this. Because that's the, the one thing that will keep people coming back. Um, I've read, I've got um, some links in the, when, you, when you get the presentation, if you end up downloading it. Um, there's been whole psychological studies done at university levels of people feeling like they should be able to do something, and that being the only impetus for them to just keep doing it every single day for months and not stop, not get bored, and get addicted to the feeling of, I should be able to do this, to the point that they crave it so badly that it actually can become quite unhealthy in some places. Um, back in the early 2000s, um, there were some deaths of DBT in um, South Korea of people playing in StarCraft tournaments because they didn't get up. They didn't stand up. That was it. They just sat there and played because they just couldn't win in these tournaments. So they just kept playing and playing and playing to get as good as possible. And the same thing can happen in a mobile game. And I said that we were going to be um, you know, towing the line of ethics here, but you want people to actually be that hooked because that gets them to keep playing and that will tie into the in-app purchases which I'm going to in a little bit. So, using your visuals, using your sound cues, music, all that sort of thing, you can actually keep people on track and focused of what that goal is. And if they stay focused enough on what that goal is and you keep that balance of difficulty just right and just hidden enough, they will keep on goal. Even though it's challenging, even though it's difficult, I remember I played for about 10 days, probably putting in about 4 hours a day on Ski Safari just to be able to get the second eagle um, achievement. You have to be picked up by an eagle, drop from it and then touch another eagle. It took me forever to actually do it, but because it was so, it was the only task left, I think I'd finished everything else in the game at that point by finishing off the second and third task. Um, and I just needed to do it. I had to have that sense of completion. Um, and it's that sense of completion alone at that point in the game that just kept me going. And it kept me on target because every single time I finished the game, came up the little uh, task screen, it was there again. And then it would go away when I was playing and then it would come back up and remind me again and again and again. And it was done in such a non-threatening way that it didn't feel like a you know, dominatrix standing over me saying, get the second eagle! It felt like it was a challenge put forward and I felt like I should be able to do it because I'd done everything else. And it was disappointing for me that every time that I failed, but not disappointing enough that I wanted to give up on the game. There was a day where I thought, no, that's it. I've, I've got a problem, I'm going to put it down, and I fixed it up again a day later. I even deleted it off my phone, and then I found out that my save was stored in the cloud. It's dangerous. So, yeah, the, uh, that sense of completion can be one of your driving factors for making a game as addictive as possible. I know that um, many games will have not just a high score or you've completed the level, but a percentage complete of the level. And a lot of players see that as just sweet, sweet candy. You know, I've finished all the levels in the game, but only at 90%. A good example is the Guitar Hero series. I have never, I've, I've prided, prided myself in being able to get 98% on medium on Dragon Force Through the Fire and Flames. I could never get higher than 98%, and it's, to this day it drives me mad. I've still got, I, I bought the game again so that I could try and beat it, and I, I still can't, I can only get to 98%. Other people can, I'm just terrible with it. So it's, uh, there's this, that sort of hauntingness um, where you get the same value for money for very little extra work. Um, that's from a you know, developer perspective, but 
if you have a game like Angry Birds, you can get those star ratings on the, on the levels. Yes, you can finish it by pure accident, um, as most of the levels are completed when you're playing Angry Birds. But if you do it just right, you'll get that three stars or whatever the system they're using now. And that's a whole second set of completion. You can go through and say, all right, I'm just going to complete the game and then I'll be done with it. But then you look back over your completed game and you've got a lot of three star ratings that you could be achieving. So people go back and they'll play the entire game again just to get perfection. So it's, it's something to uh, take into consideration because you can actually book somebody in for at least twice the time. Most of the time, to actually get 100% on every level, it will be much more than just twice the time. So, the reward in a video game, or that you get from a video game, is not much different to the reward that a drug user gets when they're <laughs> getting a hit. Like I said, total line of ethics here. But it's, it's as simple as that. If you have somebody that is desperately craving that hit, when you give it to them, it's like complete relief for a short while. But video games are the same thing. People want that hit. I mean, anybody that's ever known somebody that got a little too attached to World of Warcraft will know what I'm talking about. They start getting distracted and jittery when they've been off the server for too long. It can get quite unhealthy. Mobile games, you get a very sort of muted version of that, um, which you want to actually tie into. But as horrible as it sounds, you really want to try and deliver dosed hits to people. And you do that through these means that I'm, going to be, that I'm showing you in this presentation. Uh, you, you want to hold off giving them the big hit, the big fix. A lot of games will are very, very quick to give somebody a big reward, too flashy graphics, too big a sound. Um, little things that are hidden away, like on a previous slide you might have seen, I mentioned the um, announcer voice in Unreal Tournament 2004. If you kill two people in quick succession, it says double kill. And then if you kill three, it says multi-kill. It goes ultra kill, monster kill, ludicrous kill, holy shit. And then you want them to say holy shit because that's a bit funny. And it's cool to hear the announcer say that, but it's also the ultimate kill count. If you get to that, you've, you've done the best that the game will actually reward you for. If you just keep killing people after that, just keep saying holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. But that there is a, you know, it's a big hit of something, but getting double kill is a little hit. To get the multi-kill is a little bit bigger hit, and you want to try and dose them like that. So things such as, um, as, as I'll be, um, as I said, I'm going to be talking about Jetpack Joyride a lot. Jetpack Joyride does little things quite cleverly, like after you've been playing for, you know, a minute and 30 seconds, You'll have been traveling through the labs, but all of a sudden your background will change. It will turn into this clear tube where you're actually seeing a sort of like an underground jungle behind it. That's a little hit. All of a sudden everything's different. It's the same game. It doesn't affect the gameplay in any way whatsoever. But because you've got this fresh visual flush into your into your into your eyes, it's a reward. It's a little hit. And it makes you want to get back there again. Because when you eventually die and you start a new game, Oh, I'm back in the boring labs. This is what I've been, now I've seen the jungle. I know that there's more out there. What's next after that? What's next after that? Uh, I've been doing the same thing with the um, rep, was it radical repelling that the half brick have out. That's another great game. There are all these sort of levels of of, uh, of world that you can get to. I have no idea where it's going. I've gotten underwater before. What, what, how much deeper can they go? But I know there's got to be more. You know. It's, if we break out into another another dimension, I don't, I don't know, but that sort of hit can be good. The sound rewards that you get for it are, are good. Um, there's uh, the, the um, secret agent was a good example. There's a sound that only plays when you have gotten. I think it's uh, there's three letters S A M secret agent man um, hidden throughout every map, and if you collect them in order, you'll get a special points bonus, but also a sound that only plays when you've done that particular challenge. So that is sort of a, a big hit. Getting the little hits of the sounds of each letter is a little hit. So you want to try and dose people in that way. So I've got an example here. It, it, it's like somebody who's trying to quit smoking. If you lock them away in a room where they get fresh air conditioned air all the time, it's a lot easier for them to quit smoking than if they have to walk past the smoking section of a pub every day on the way to work. Yeah. You know, you've probably seen friends do it if they're trying to quit before. It's very difficult for them to smell the secondhand smoke and not want to go back. It's the same with a video game. I kept seeing people play Ski Safari on the bus 
wasn't good. Um, <laughs> back, back then, it was the, the big thing. Everyone was playing Ski Safari. Um, so it's, it's the same sort of thing. Things will remind you of things in the game, and you want, you want to go back and play. It's quite literally an addiction. So you want to avoid them realizing that their addiction is unhealthy. Because, as, as I was going to say, is it, it, it's a video game in the end, it's a smartphone game, so the worst thing that's going to happen to them is they'll get arthritis in their thumbs. So it's, it's uh, not too bad, but you want to use the visuals, use the sound, use the hits that you're giving them sparingly and correctly and not just overwhelm. So many games I see, they just overwhelm and throw everything at you and you, you realize if it's a good game, like I find Candy Crush a bit overwhelming with the visuals and the sounds and things. And because of that, you start realizing that it's influencing you. It's, um, unfortunately, it's that way. You start seeing that the, the, you're, you don't have the freedom in the game that you would like. Uh, so you want to try and you know, ease back on that a little bit. Uh, leveling up is a good example of that. Um, if you get them focused on leveling up, you can make them do amazing things when they're at 9,000 XP and the level up is at 10,000 XP and it's just around the corner or 9,090 XP. Um, it's this sort of thing where people will say, I've been playing this game too long tonight, it's 3 a.m. and I have to be out work, for work at 6, but oh look, I'm 10 points away from a level up. That's the sort of decision that you want to make them do, and leveling up is a fantastic way to actually give that for, once again, very little effort, very great reward. Um, I've seen people do incredible things to actually get a level up, take incredible risks in a game that they wouldn't normally do. So your in-app purposes, like I said earlier, they're not just there for the sake of being there. A lot of people want to make money in video games, very understandable, there's a lot of money to be made in video games, but if you just want to throw in purchases for the sake of having purchases, then you're probably not going to make much money. Purchases have to be there for a specific purpose. Now this entire section, as you'll notice, is themed Jetpack Joyride. Because it was the first, it, there were probably games before it, but I noticed it um, as uh, clearly in Jetpack Joyride first. But in the game, there is a, an in-game currency of the gold coins, and as you're flying down the tunnels, you're picking up the gold coins. And if you want, you can grind away, play every day, pick up all the coins, and buy all of the things in the shop. Very few people are that patient, because the really, really cool items, the ones that you really want to get, are quite expensive in the game. But you can, just for $1.99, get 5,000 coins, and then you can just buy the things that you want. The things that you want in the game there's two types. There's useful things and there's completely pointless things. The pointless things, however, are collectible, which makes them useful, if that makes sense. So, I'll talk about the useful things first. There's the things like, there's a coin magnet that, while you're holding it, makes coins actually fly towards you. So, it doesn't help you win the game, it doesn't help you do particularly better, but it helps you get more coins, which makes you want things more in the shop quite clever because you start seeing yourself getting closer, faster to the, the really cool things. Um, you can get other things like a head start, like I was saying, wanting to get to the jungle section faster because now the, the, the lab section is boring. The head start will actually get you most of the way there. So if you spend your coins on those, you can skip the first part of the game, which is now a bit boring for you, which allows them to recycle their game even longer and get more gameplay out of it. Um, so. A lot of people get bored with um, having to grind for the coins and they'll just buy them. Or they'll just buy things directly from the store. The collectible side of things is the costumes and the jetpacks that he has. A lot of things come with matching sets. Like, for example, one of them is he, you can buy a tux for him to be in, so he's flying through the, the, the lab with a jetpack on and a perfectly tailored tux. You can also buy a top hat, and it looks really good with the top hat. But then you start wondering, I wonder what the tux looks like with a baseball helmet. That'd be really funny. And then I'll put a jetpack on him that shoots bubbles out of it instead of fire. That, that'd be funny. And you start, because of that funny reaction, because of the, the nature of wanting to customise uh, your character, people want to push for those things. But then they've spent all their money on clothes and they really want to get the coin magnet, so they've got to work a bit harder. And eventually frustration overtakes them and they just spend money in the store. And that's why in-app purchases can work, because there's a purpose for it. There's uh, tying into that addiction. Who here either does it themselves or knows somebody that when they start a new game in an RPG and realize that there is a character customization section at the start, 
will spend more time in that in their first session than playing the actual game. My wife, for example, will quite literally, she has spent two and a half hours in oblivion going through and just changing the look, little things, then, you know, switch that a little bit, and then looking at reference photos <laughs> of, like, Lord of the Rings fan art and things like that. Just, it, I, don't, I don't get it, but she does it, she, it's a very important to her. And in a mobile game, Barry Steak Fries, the character in, in Jetpack Joyride, is this big on the screen, he's bloody tiny, but you can make that tiny thing wear a tux that's made of about 18 pixels, and you really want to. And you don't know why, but you do. So, you know, that's an important thing. The collectible side of it is the same psychological response that makes games like Magic the Gathering uh, popular. It makes games like Pokemon popular. People want to collect them all, they want to catch them all. Because it's not just uh, them doing it at that point. It's they're seeing other people play the game. They're seeing their friends play the game. They're seeing family members play the game. And it's like, oh, you've got the bubble jetpack. I don't have that yet, but now I want it because it looks really cool. So it turns into a social thing. You've got the advent of the internet now, so everybody's sharing everything else. And if you have the particular, if you space the particularly cool things right at the far end of the buying spectrum, people will work to get there. They will see, yes, you can get a jetpack that shoots rainbow cooing unicorns, but all I've got at the moment is my bubble jetpack, and I need to get twenty thousand coins to get the, the, the rainbow one. But, you know, I'm going to get it. I'm, I'm already at 10,000, so I'm going to, going to save. But then something else will come up. They might need a head start or something because they get sidetracked and chase a high, high score. So then that drains their coins and they have to go back. And all of this ends up leading people to suspend, oh, it's just a buck 99, it's just whatever, to buy 10,000 coins easy. And then they do it and you get money straight away. And when you've got 10 million people across the world doing this to your uh, hopefully popular game, then that adds up to a lot of money. So when you put in those in-app purchases, don't just put them in for the sake of it. I see it too often, things that I have no desire to buy in the game. They're, they don't really help the game, or it's just I can see that they're putting an incredibly basic, basic version of the game, and I have to essentially buy the game by buying this content. That's not going to inspire people to spend. So really, really look at the psychology behind why somebody would. So visuals um, are a big part that you can buy, like I was saying, with the um, with the suits and, and things like that. Um, if you haven't played Jetpack Jar, check it out. I do have a video, but since things aren't really working, I can't show it to you. Um, but have a look, browse around. I think it's free now on the App Store because um, their in-app purchases are going so well. So um, do, do check that out. So, motion. This one, I may be using the document thing for, but we'll see. Uh, I'm going to be going into a range of game examples, some of them very, very old, some of them very obscure, but they're all really good examples of different types of motion in five different types of games. This is by no means every type of game there is, this is just the, the ones that are, um, I'm using for my example. So. We've got flappy games, jumpy games, flighty games, runny games, and action games. So first off, uh, flappy games. And as I was just talking about Flappy Bird, anybody else played Joust back in the 80s and early 90s? Fantastic game. Um, it's, I consider it to be, just from my personal design standpoint, one of the greatest movement systems in a video game ever. Um, the sense of inertia that you get while moving is incredible. And that sense of inertia really, really speaks back through that cathartic interaction and makes you lean on the controls, something chronic, uh, especially when the pterodactyl is chasing you. So, what happens is, uh, I'll see if I can switch. This can work. Hey, look at that. Work. So, you've got your little, little bird character here. Now, if you haven't played the game, you, you play a knight that rides on an ostrich. I know, it's weird. You've got a little jousting lance out the front, and you'll be flying at other knights on other ostriches with their own jousting lances. Now, to win the game, you have to kill all the other knights in the map. And there'll be little platforms around like this that you can jump on, and down the bottom there's sort of a lake of lava and a little platform. And when you touch each other, so when the two, two people go, it measures your lances. 
like this. And if your lance, the green one, is higher than the other person's lance when you touch, they die. If their lance is higher than yours, you die. If they're equal, you bounce off one another. And that's the entire, entirety of the game, really. When you kill them, they turn into an egg that falls to the ground, and you can pick up that egg to get points. If you don't pick it up fast enough, it hatches into another enemy, and you've got a whole problem all over again. There's three different types of enemies, that each one, the only difference is that they move faster, and oftentimes faster than you, which makes it quite difficult. But the movement style is quite unique. It's all based on inertia. There's vertical inertia and horizontal inertia. So your character, when you press the flat button, will get an upward burst of inertia, and he'll bounce upwards like that before starting to fall back down again. If you keep tapping rhythmically, he keeps flapping up and going up and up and up. The horizontal inertia, however, is a persistence of motion thing. You build up inertia and it doesn't slow down. So if you start pressing left and right, you will eventually move faster and faster sideways. When you combine the two of them, you start getting a long curve like that. So you press right and flat at the same time. You'll go up really quickly and then gradually fall down again because your flapping up movement is much faster than your falling down movement. You sort of glide because you know, you're on an ostrich. So that makes perfect sense. But if you keep flapping at exactly the right time in your fall, you start getting this sort of hop that gets cut off again with another hop and then cut off again with another hop. Now I've got videos of this but can't show you unfortunately. So let's switch back to this and you can see when I was trying to draw very, very badly. Um, Flappy Bird uses exactly the same movement system except you don't control the horizontal movement. When you flap, it thrusts you forward. You just at maximum speed, you can't help it. But you control both the upward inertia and the forward um, falling, how far he falls downward by tapping the flat button. That bounce is an exact copy without the horizontal control of the joust movement system, which is fantastic. And it played into it so well to, to the addiction side of things because when you are pressing that flat with one tap of your screen, you're controlling the entire game. Just like in Jetpack Joe, as I was mentioning before. But Flappy Bird seems like it should be simple. You have one control, one goal for the entire game. There aren't even other real goals. You have to just avoid the green Mario pipes, which are blatant ripoffs of Mario, but you know, that's another story. So what you want to do is make sure that the feedback of that is right. Now, if you take a look at this uh, flapping cycle, <coughs> That shape of the flap has a height to it, has a speed, a uh, time to reach the apex of the jump, and it has an amount of time needed to get back to the base level, like this. So those three factors seem like just, you know, that's just a, a function of a curve. It is just a function of a curve. However, if you were to change any of those three values, it would be a completely different flap. So they've nailed it, they've got it just right. It has exactly copied the movement of Joust, which got it right. So a lot of people will say, oh, it's just a jump cycle. No big deal. Oh, it's just a flap cycle, it's just movement. Getting that right, narrowing down what those aspects are and playing with them until you get one that feels just right is so important. So important, I cannot stress it enough that so many people overlook this. But you take a movement like that and just say you've got it right, you finally you've got those three measurements right, and your flat feels perfect when you do it. You take that and apply it to your character, and then apply movement to your character's animation. For example, when you hit, or your character always stays with the wings up like this when it's falling in joust. But as soon as you hit the flat button, he goes like that, and as soon as he falls again, he's wings go back down, almost like the, the air rushing past him lifts his wings back up. Because of that, you see your character lift and move at the same time. Even something as simple as that, you'd be surprised how little it's done in games. And when somebody lands on the ground, oftentimes you'll see a sort of a sprite just land like that. People don't land like that when they're doing their land. They hit the ground and they bounce and they go back up. Sort of like a squash and stretch that you would have learned in, you know, your graphic design 101 or animation 101. 
Um, you need to actually reflect that in your character because you can take the good feeling that the perfect cycle of a flat or a jump takes and multiply it massively by adding in these reactive character animations. Because remember, the character isn't the only thing interacting with the world. Um, you're, you're touching the world, which is making things happen, which is making interaction happen. And then this character is actually the one doing it. So you need to make sure that the world feels like it's affecting them, because that creates a cathartic response between you and the character that you're fly, uh, flying, or running, or jumping. So the jump examples I've got Secret Agent and Commander King 4, one of the greatest games ever con conceived. Fantastic game. Um, that had two types of movement. If you could jump by running on foot, or you could be on your pogo stick, where you would constantly jump over and over again. Um, and I've got here four different examples. If I actually keep track of the screen, four different examples of jump cycles: linear, parabolic, trigonomic, and Fibonacci. This is something that, for some reason, just completely goes over most developers' heads when on a platformer, but they're so important. The amount of time the player spends at the apex of the jump, the amount of time it takes them to reach maximum velocity or lose maximum velocity, how long they stay still for at the top of the jump, all of these are important factors which get overlooked. Because you can make a jump cycle feel really, really good, like in Secret Agent. They didn't have the technology at the time when they were making Secret Agent to have the animations that tied into it, so they had to rely on the motion. So the motion in Secret Agent feels just good. Very unrealistic jump physics, let me tell you now. But this is, it was the, 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 uh, the 90s and nobody cared. So um, when you are doing a jump cycle or coaxing a developer through a jump cycle, a lot of times they'll do something linear or parabolic, the most common. They just think, oh, either they need to go up and go down because that's retro and simple. There's much more to it than that. Or parabolic will be the nice cop out because it's very easy to code in. The guy jumps up, slows down a bit, and then falls down. It seems like it would make it a lot better. But I tell you now, by tweaking that function, you can make jumping be an addictive action. And if jumping is the purpose of the game, the game becomes addictive, if that makes sense. So, there's other examples like in Crash Bandicoot series. Uh, I think it was in Crash Bandicoot Cortex's, a uh, rapid cortex that he finally was able to double jump. When he double jumps, he actually will float for a brief moment and do a flip and then fall down again. That simple act of just making him float for that tiny amount of time made the entire flip feel like it was a bit more natural. Because if he was flipping while he moved, that would be very realistic. But because he's a cartoon character, he's an anthropomorphized bandicoot, it makes more sense and more cartoony feel, makes it tie into the whole graphic design aspect to make him sort of jump up in the air, do a flip, and then land. Because it uh, harkens back to everything that we grew up with, with Warner Brothers cartoons and that sort of thing, where Wile and Cody would walk off the edge of a cliff and only fall when he realized that he was floating over thin air, that sort of thing. So it ties in with your visual appeal. Obviously, if you're doing you know, Call of Duty, you're not going to make the guy float at the top of his jump because that's kind of this, this, you're not what you're going for. So, really, really analyze that motion. If you've got a basic engine, one thing I like to do when I'm starting a new game is make a really, really basic version of it, uh, just with blocks moving around the screen, things like that. Screen cap it of you playing it, bouncing around, things like that. If it doesn't feel good, if it's not really addictive to jump around and you've got a platform up, that you're doing something wrong. So screen cap it, get out of Camtasia or whatever, record the whole thing, and then plot the actual arcs, just like I've done here, plot the arcs of the jump, and you'll find that there are different aspects, like I was saying with the flap, these different aspects that you can tweak purely through mathematical functions of the jump cycle to make it more addictive, less addictive. So really, really play with it. So flying games, things like Raiden, or as I've got, I um, oh, left King 4 up there, it's actually uh, R-Type Delta, that's, that's me working on this at 2 o'clock this morning, um, and Dodon Pachi, if you've ever played that, uh, Don Pachi is uh, apparently means bullet curtain, when you translate into English, and Dodon Pachi is the sequel, but it's, um, it's pretty much an adequate description of the game. Uh, they're sort of the, those, you know, scrolling ship fly, flying games. Very, very simple form of game, and a very common one that people go into when they're first sort of playing around with game ideas. 
Uh, they're not super popular anymore. Haven't seen too many uh, really big hits with them. But the ones that I have seen have not really put much thought into the movement of the ship. Things like if you've got the ship sitting here and you press right, it will just start moving right. And if you let go of the right button, it stops. That's very, very linear, very, very basic. A little bit of persistence of motion starts giving a sense of being in an anti-gravity situation or flying. I guarantee you if you take a jet, jet plane and you yank the joystick all the way to the right, you're not just going to linearly move and then stop. You'll float and then slow down and stop. Things like that. Uh, just like the jump cycles, you can have a movement cycle where you might want to make it so that you can't just start moving at full speed. You ramp up your speed and then start moving. You might want to make it so that you do start at full speed, but you can't stop immediately. You have to ramp down, which means if somebody does want to stop immediately, they've got to get good at tapping the left and right buttons to sort of uh, counteract the movement. You might want to implement persistence of motion, something like in Asteroid, the classic game. Once you've actually built up speed, you just keep moving at that speed until you compensate for it in the other direction. Little things like that, a lot of people just say, oh, it's just a different type of game. It's not. It's a different type of movement in the same type of game. That's what you've got to really analyze. And once again, just like I was saying, with characters landing properly or flapping properly in the animation surrounding that movement, same thing can happen with these. You can see here the ship is actually rocking back and forth. You'd be surprised how many shooter games don't actually move their ship. You want to see things like the engines on one side of the ship flare up a little bit because that communicates back to the player that they have done something, they have interacted with the game, it's responding back to them. It's that communication because it's part of the experience. Even if they're not aware of it at a conscious level, it will register with them. Same thing with weapons in this sort of game. Weapons are incredibly powerful um, visual tools because what really is the difference between a laser blast and shooting out a missile? There's just projectiles going out. So how can you make them a little bit better? You can make a missile feel so much more powerful if when you hit the fire button you see the rocket shoot out the back first and then it unlocks from the ship. Something like that. Or if you've got a plasma weapon you might see it build up the energy and then shoot it out. Those will build and release things. And just like the build and release in the jewel when you get the cascade. It's the same sort of thing. It gives more of a sense of this is a good thing. This is a more powerful thing. A lot of people will put it just in the, that attention just into the hits of the weapons. If it blows up bigger when it actually hits the target, then it's a better weapon. You've actually got to show that it's affecting the ship and therefore you, because you are piloting the ship. You want to feel that that weapon had power behind it. Um, the Doom series is a good one for that. The BFG 9000. Um, when, you fire, when you hit fire, the gun did not shoot. The gun shot about three quarters of a second later because you, you f everything around the gun starts glowing green. And you could hear the sound, and then it would shoot, and everything in front of you would just obliterate. And you wouldn't even know what just went on because it just <laughs> covered everything. That gives a sense that it was the most powerful gun because every other gun in the game just shot. You hit the shoot button on the plasma rifle, a bolt of plasma comes out, you, you hit it on the, the nail gun in Quake, the nails come out, but there's always that big gun at the end of, the, of, of every shooter game that needs a bit of a charge time. And there's only ever one, which is very odd, because you can make use of that power so much better. Same thing with power-ups for your engines. You might want to move faster, make it look like you're moving faster, really have that, uh, if you have little gills on the side of your ship, little like power coils, make them start building up one, 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 and then out come the engines, you know? Make it look like something big has built. Because that built and then re and released power will actually translate back to the user. And it's not something you should skip over. So runner games, they were all the rage about three years ago and they're sort of starting to peter off a bit now. They're building up again in the Android market space. Um, you got like, uh, what was that one where the, you're in like an Aztec temple being chased by things? Temple, temple Runner, that's the one. Yeah, no, that was super popular. Um, I remember when I was growing up, I used to play Jet Slalom. Has anyone played that? Really obscure game. You played all the same games as me. I was on the like Java website, so it's like cool games. Yeah, yeah, it was like a top Java game when the internet was still kind of new. And holy crap, is it addictive as hell. It looks simple, it looks boring, but it's essentially, uh, I think it was, there was a game where you were riding motorbikes through a forest ages ago, I can't remember, like Death Race or something, I can't remember what it 
it's called. But it's just a blatant ripoff of that. Um, all it is is that you're moving forward at a constant velocity. You can turn at a ramped velocity up to a maximum one. And objects are flying at you, or you're flying through the objects really, but you just have to avoid them. That's the whole thing. Just don't touch anything. And eventually the objects get denser and denser and denser and denser, and then eventually there'll be a scripted tunnel that you have to fly through. And all you have to do is just not touch anything. Very, very simple. But that ramped movement of left and right turning made you really lean on the control. I literally have snapped a keyboard in half playing that game. It just buckled under, it was, it was up on the feet, and I was pressing it and it just buckled because I was, I'd gotten further than I'd ever gotten before. I was up to stage five in it which is, if you've ever played a game, it's insane. I've been <laughs> playing it every day for about a year at that point, and I snapped a keyboard. So that should give you an idea of the amount of cathartic effect. Yes? Did uh, breaking that keyboard have a positive cathartic effect? Or? Well, I suppose. It's something that people would then brag about. Just broke a keyboard playing Jet Slayer, la 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 Hashtag addictive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that sort of thing is the sort of thing people would brag about. It's just like people would say that, uh, you know, I have heard people actually brag that they got constipated for three days because of a massive wow session. That they, just, <laughs> they didn't get up, they didn't eat enough, and they didn't drink enough, and they got massively constipated. That's how much they love wow. I've heard people actually say that, and I've wanted to face palm so hard that I would have had to stick my tooth through a master brush my teeth. But that is a thing that people are proud of. And this is the market that you're making games for. So, you know, tying into that is an important thing. Skyroads, anyone played Skyroads? Please tell me the people who played Skyroads. Yes, fantastic game. Similar to Jet Slalom, except you've got uh, hard coded levels that get more and more difficult. Basically, you can bounce in the game. You're a ship that bounces for some reason. You can control your forward speed, you can control when you bounce. And that's about it. These levels will fly past you at the speed that you're flying. You've got a certain amount of time that you have to complete them in. Uh, and there are different surfaces. I don't know if you can. Is the mouse going to show up? There we go. I've got a mouse. Things like these tunnels up here. Uh, I do have a video of this, but I can't show you. Uh, these tunnels, you have to line up perfectly to go through them because if your wing clips them, then you die. The colored surfaces. Uh, the coloured surfaces aren't just for decoration. Different colours actually, some are slipperier, some are not, some are uh, sticky and will slow you down. Some of them will burn you, some of them will bounce you automatically, things like that. So you have to learn all of these things and get through stage after stage after stage. And it was addictive as hell because the controls were so simple. Left, right, forward, back, for faster and slower, and space was jump. Very, very straightforward. But you had that feeling of, I should be able to finish this, it's really simple. And because the levels weren't procedural, they weren't random, they were fixed. You started learning them to the point where you could do them in your, just in your sleep, eyes closed, just do these levels. But then you'd get to a hard one and it was a matter of strategy. And you'd gotten through so much at that point that it was masterful in that each of the uh, levels was put into a different stage. So you'd go through stage one that would have five levels, stage two had five levels. And they were always, it started out easier. The, the easier ones would introduce a new type of colour surface, for example, but it would do it in a very easy way so the player learns how it works in a very non-threatening environment. And then all of a sudden you get thrown in the deep end and you do, have to do something that seems like it would be absolutely bloody impossible. But can, you can do it. I've seen speedruns of sky roads that give me a headache. People are incredible at it. I could never, never finish the game, but it did stop me trying. Uh, so you really want that leaning effect. You really want people, especially with runner games, um, the Temple Runner was a good example because you had people chasing you. Um, Crash Bandicoot's another example with the, the boulder levels where the boulder's running at you and it runs the screen. Have you ever been playing one of those games and you see what's chasing you getting closer and closer and closer and you know the end has got to be somewhere pretty close. This level's been going for like a solid minute and you know, it, you know it's near. But you start feeling that sort of coldness in your spine, and the, the hairs lift up on the back of your neck, and you find you, you, you realize that you were sitting here when you started, now you're over here, like this sweat beating on your forehead. And then you get there, and it's sort of this flood of relief. Oh, I did it, I did it, can't believe it. Yes? 
how to think of the last level of Halo 1. You know. Oh, with the flood! Oh, yeah. that was insane. Anyone that hasn't played Halo 1 all the way to the end, there's a section of the game where you're fighting this on -run, oncoming horde of these aliens, but it's been deliberately designed so that you run out of ammo. There's just too many of them. So eventually it will get to a point where you have this realisation, I've got to beat my way out. And when you have that realisation, you realise it's the best game you've ever played at that point. I was thinking more about the Warthog run to the end. Oh yeah, through the ship, yeah. Well, that was good too. That whole section with the flood over, over coming, it was just this constant on and off of you're this close from death at all, all points. And yeah, um, But the, the, the rush of relief at the end makes you realise that your body, even though your mind realised it was just a game, your body didn't. Your body realized, thought that it was a real dangerous scenario and you had been pumped full of adrenaline and you were ready to embrace your sweet death. <laughs> and then your mind goes, what the hell body, it was just a video game. But because of that feeling, it feels like it was an experience. It feels like this is the sort of thing that you know, forms friendship bonds when, you, when you've done this in a multiplayer experience, you know, you kind of, it's like if you've gone through an epic uh, instance in an MMO, an MMO with some friends and it's had that effect and you've just barely scraped through to the end, it's the sort of thing that you talk about years later. It's, it's an event that happened, it's not just a game anymore. Uh, in the, that, when you're starting to have actual physiological and psychological long-term ramifications on a person. It's not just a video game anymore. And the more immersive games, like runner games, have that effect. I'm mean, not necessarily on that large scale. It takes a more intricate game to do that. But if you have somebody on a quiet, packed bus at peak hour in the morning finally reach the end of a level they've been trying for for years and involuntarily scream out, YES! <laughs> in the middle of the bus and then look around and realise where they are and go, you know, go back to what they were doing. 